AI image generation tools such as Midjourney and Dali have taken over social media by creating a wide range of images, everything from memes and art to beautiful UI UX designs. This technology is changing the way we interact with images and has the potential to revolutionize industries. Hi there, and welcome to a project video where you'll build and deploy a full stack MERN AI image generation app, your own and improved version of Midjourney and DALI. With modern and minimal design, dynamic image layout, a hover effect that showcases a user's prompt to generate each AI image, their name and the download button, search functionality, the ability to create new AI-generated images by clicking the Surprise Me button or entering absolutely any text you can think of, sharing your post with the community, and much more. This OpenAI Midjourney clone is the best AI image generation app that you can currently find on YouTube. After you develop this great app, I'll even teach you how to deploy it to the internet so that you can share it with your friends, potential employers, and put it on your portfolio. This video is perfect for you if you want to dive into the trend of developing AI technologies and learn how to use OpenAI's APIs to your advantage. You might be wondering, what are the prerequisites for building such a fantastic application? Well, this course is entirely beginner-friendly. You only need a solid understanding of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. A basic understanding of React, Node, and MongoDB can be helpful but that's not a requirement. Alongside building this application, you'll learn how to use the most in-demand technologies today. Node.js, Express, MongoDB, and React together form the powerful MERN stack. Tailwind, the most popular CSS framework nowadays. OpenAI's DALI model, a deep learning model that generates images from text input. Cloudinary, a cloud-based image storage service to make our image load speeds fast. We're going to start simple and then move to more complex concepts as we go. I'll explain every step of the way. If this video reaches 20,000 likes, I'm recording more artificial intelligence videos. Before we start building out our project, let's first get the hosting and the domain name for our new site, your portfolio, or any website you'll create in the future. Hostinger is my personal recommendation, and right now they're offering a crazy deal. Two bucks and 79 cents a month with a four year plan plus three months extra, so I simply needed to show this to you. The link with an extra discount is in the description. Let's click the claim deal button to see if it is really as good as it sounds. It seems like we're getting web hosting for about two and a half bucks and we can host 100 websites, also receive 100 gigabytes of SSD storage, unlimited SSL certificate, meaning that we have HTTPS security, we get a free domain and a free email. That is crazy. Hostinger also has a phenomenal customer support 24 seven, as you can see by all of the great ratings right here. On top of all the primary benefits that I just mentioned, they also offer a ton of additional features. Excellent price to quality ratio, high speed servers, and absolutely everything you need for our great AI image generation website. We're going to create an entire social media platform, so we want to have a custom domain name so we seem credible. For every industry standard application, such as the one you're building in this video, we need it to be fast, reliable, and trustworthy. And all of the features you're getting with this plan, such as a custom domain name, email, and speed, makes all the difference. Since I've partnered with Hostinger, they decided to give you an even bigger discount. You can find the link and a unique discount code in the description. Enjoy! Once you visit the link in the description, click Claim Deal, and then Add to Cart. Here, we have to choose the period of our hosting. With a crazy discount going on right now, I'll definitely choose 48 months to save the most money. And down below, you can choose your payment method, and then you can enter your coupon code. That is JavaScript Mastery, all caps. That's going to give you an even bigger discount. After you complete the purchase, you'll be redirected to the Hostinger's dashboard. 
I'll see you there. And we're back to the Hostinger's dashboard. As you can see, I'm personally using Hostinger for all of my company's websites. If you purchase premium shared hosting, you should see this claim domain button right here. So let's go ahead and claim it. We can choose our domain ending. I'm gonna go with .com. And let's go with something like JSM Dali. This should be available, hopefully. There we go, it is, and we can immediately claim it. Hopefully you can come up with something better for our AI image generation social media platform. Try to think of a unique and short name. Let's go ahead and click claim domain. Of course, you can do this at the end of the video as well. And just like that, our domain is active. We can also go back to home and we can start setting up our premium web hosting so that we can easily deploy it at the end of the video. You can go to setup, start now. We can skip this entire process and create an empty website. You can choose a domain. In this case, we're gonna go for DALI, select and finish setup. It's as easy as that. And in about half a minute, Hostinger is going to set up everything for us so that at the end of the video, you can just come back to the Hostinger's dashboard and get your project deployed easily. Great, as you can see, it's already done. To get started with building our great AI image generation application, we're going to start as we always do on JavaScript Mastery, and that is from bare beginnings. We'll start by creating a new empty folder on our desktop. Let's call it something like DALI underscore clone, and then we can drag and drop it into an empty Visual Studio Code window. Once you're there, you can go to View and then Terminal. We're gonna use Visual Studio Code's integrated terminal to create our folder and file structure, both for our client and our server side, since we're building a full stack Marine application. So to get started, let's right click right here and create a new folder called client or frontend. Inside of here, we're gonna generate our entire React file and folder structure by using Vite. Vite is a new generation tool that is much faster than regular Create React app. So you can just go to vjs.dev, click Get Started, and then we can see how we can start a new React application. That's simply going to be npm create, vite, and then add latest. Back in our Visual Studio code, we can cd into client, and there we can run npm create, vite, add latest, and then type dot slash to create it in its current repository and press enter. This is going to start a quick questionnaire asking us which framework do we want to work with. In this case, let's proceed with React. We're gonna use a JavaScript variant and that's it. As you can see, the file and folder structure has been generated inside of the client folder. The only thing we need to do is run npm install. Now, before we officially run our application, there are a couple of things we have to set up. I will give you all of the assets that we'll be using throughout building this great project. So down below in the description, you can find a link to the zipped assets folder. Now inside of our SRC, you can already see some assets. We can go ahead and delete that one. And then you can unzip that folder from the description. And then you can simply paste it right inside of here, or you can drag and drop it. There, we're gonna have a download icon, a logo, and a preview.png, just a couple of assets that are going to make the development of our application much easier. On top of that, I've also prepared another file for you. That's going to be inside of a folder called constants. There, you can create an index.js file. And then again, down in the description, inside of a GitHub gist, you can find this array. It is an array of 50 different prompts which we're gonna use as surprise me prompts right here. So that if a user doesn't know what they would like to create, we can instantly give them some ideas. Great. Now, as you can see, this doesn't contain any logic, simply assets, images, and constants. On top of that, there are also some styles that we need to create to make the development simpler. So you can delete everything that is inside of the index.css and then down in the description in the GitHub gist, you can find the replacement for the index.css file. Again, it's just 23 lines of really simple CSS 
where we set up things like fonts and Tailwind. Since we're on the topic of Tailwind, let's go ahead and install it. Tailwind is a utility first CSS framework that's going to make the styling of our application much simpler using utility classes. Now we can go to get started. Then you can click framework guides, and then you can choose Vite. There, we simply need to follow all the steps. We have already created our project, so we can proceed to step number two, and we can run this line. Back in our code, we can go to view and then terminal, make sure that you're in the client folder, and then simply run npm install dash D, Tailwind CSS, post CSS, and auto prefixer. Then we can copy the next line, that's going to be mpx tailwind css init dash p. That just created the tailwind.config.cjs. Inside of here, there are also some predefined theme styles that we have to add. In that same GitHub just down in the description, you can simply find the replacement for the tailwind.config.cjs and you can paste it over. We're simply adding some media queries, font families, and box shadows. Finally, we have to add the Tailwind directives to our CSS, which we already did inside of our index, and then we are ready to run our application. To make sure that we install Tailwind CSS correctly, let's copy this H1. So if we go into our app, we can see that right here, we're importing some kind of a logo, use state, app CSS, we don't need any of that. So let's simply remove it. And let's run RAFCE. This is a function that's going to generate a simple React component. If this didn't work for you, you most likely don't have the right extensions installed. So search for ES7 plus React Redux React Native Snippets. Install that extension and then it should work. Finally, replace this div with an H1 that contains some Tailwind class names. That way, we're going to know if we installed everything correctly. Believe it or not, besides using Tailwind for styling, there's only going to be one additional package you'll be using, and it's incredibly lightweight. So you can open up view, terminal, and run npm install file dash saver. We're gonna use to save the files that we create. Besides that, everything else is going to be created by you. Every single component, every single file, and the entirety of the logic to make the AI image generation work. With that said, to make sure that we have set up our project successfully, let's run npm run dev. That's going to open up our app on localhost 5173. And there we go. We can see hello world, bolded and underlined. Now inside of the index.css, we were using a specific font called inter, but we haven't yet created it. So let's go to our index.html and right here above the title, we can add a link tag. Link that's going to have a rel equal to style sheet. It's going to have an href equal to https colon forward slash forward slash rsms.me forward slash inter forward slash inter dot CSS. With this, we're importing the inter font. And also we can change the title to DALI 2.0. Now, if we save this and go back, you can see it's looking a bit different. With that said, we are ready to start developing our great application. Let's get started by putting our browser and our code editor side by side so that we can see our changes live. Great. Now we can close all of our files and we can start focusing on the main point of contact, which is going to be our app.jsx. First, we're going to start with the layout and then we're going to move to functionality. Inside of our app.jsx, we're going to set up the routing for our application. And now there was one small lie I told you, and that was that the file saver is going to be the only package we'll be using. I, for a second, thought we were using Next.js and that we have routing set up for us by default. But unfortunately, that is not the case as we're working in React. So what we have to do is install React Router DOM. That's going to be really simple. So the only thing we have to do is type npm install react-router-dom, press enter. It got installed in less than a second and we can run npm run dev to rerun our application. 
Great, now we have everything we need to get started with the development. The first things we're gonna import are going to be browser router, also a link, a route, and routes coming from react-router-dom. We're going to also import a logo inside of a curly braces coming from dot slash assets. And we have to import two different pages we haven't yet created. So now might be a good idea to start creating the pages and components that we'll be using throughout the entirety of our application. So inside of our source, we can create a new folder called pages. Inside of there, we're going to have two pages. We're going to have a create post.jsx as well as home.jsx. Inside of both of these pages, we can run RAFCE to generate a simple functional component. There we go. Now to export both of these pages from the pages folder, we can create an index.js file that's going to serve as our export. Inside of there, we can first import home from dot slash home, as well as import create post from dot slash create post. And then we can simply export them in one object, home and create post. This is going to allow us to import them in one single line inside of our app.jsx. The only thing we have to do is say import home and create post coming from dot slash pages. To set up our app, we can delete our H1 and wrap everything with a browser router. We're using the version six of React Router DOM, the latest and greatest of what it has to offer. Inside of there, we're going to create an HTML5 semantic header tag that's going to have a class name equal to w-full for full width, flex, justify-between, items-center, bg-white on small devices, px-8 for padding horizontal, usually px4, padding y4 for top and bottom, border dash bottom or B, and then border dash B dash inside of square brackets hash E6 EBF4. This is going to be the border color and you can briefly see it right here. Now, if what I wrote right here seemed like magic, that must mean that you're not familiar with Tailwind. And that's fully okay. Tailwind is fairly new, but it has great things to offer. So if while you're watching this video, some of these styles and class names seem unfamiliar, simply go to tailwindcss.com and do a quick search. Let's go with PX. And if you type PX, we can quickly see that that is used for padding. There we go. So PX is horizontal padding, PY is vertical padding. And if you wanna learn more about any other Tailwind property, you can just type border dash B or just the name of the property that I refer and you can quickly see what that is used for. Wonderful. With that said, we can get back to the development. Inside of our header, we're going to create a link component. This link is going to have a two property pointing to just forward slash. That's going to be our homepage. And inside of there, we can render a self-closing image tag that's going to have a source equal to logo, an alt tag equal to logo, and also a class name equal to w-28 for width and then object-contain. If we save that, you can see a great OpenAI logo appear. We're using this OpenAI logo since we'll be leveraging their DALI machine learning model. Now, below this link, we can add another link. And this link is going to point to forward slash create dash post. It's going to have a class name equal to font dash enter and also font dash medium and BG dash inside of square brackets hash 6469 FF. That's going to be for the background, but also text dash white, PX dash four and PY dash two. Finally, we can make it rounded dash MD and inside of there, we can say create. 
that's going to create this great looking button on top, right? Finally, below the header, we're going to create a main section. That main section is going to have a class name. On small devices, we want to give it a padding of eight, usually a padding X of four and padding vertical or Y of eight. We want to give it a full width so it takes the entire screen and give it a BG, not white, but a bit gray. So that's going to be inside of square brackets, hash F9, FA, FE. And we can give it a min dash H dash. And now we can use a special property called calc, where we can calculate 100 VH, meaning the full height, minus 73 pixels, which is the height of our nav bar. And I think we don't need to put spaces right here. There we go. So now you can see that we have a white nav bar and we have the rest of the content in this light gray color. Inside of there, we want to render our routes. Inside of the routes, we want to render two specific self-closing route components. The first one is going to have a path equal to forward slash, meaning homepage. And the element is going to be a self-closing home component. The second route is going to also be a self-closing component, is going to have a path of forward slash create dash post, and it's going to have an element equal to a self-closing create post component. There we go. We can expand our Visual Studio code just to be able to see the code a bit more clearly. There we go. And then the browser can be as it is. Great. With that said, believe it or not, our structure of the application is done. Now we can navigate between create post and also home pages. So now we can go into one of our pages, primarily home, and we can start developing it right now. Inside of our home component, we're going to import react, but also a couple of hooks. That's going to be use state as well as use effect hooks. Then we have to import a couple of components. But as of this moment, we haven't yet created any components. So let's create a new components folder inside of our SRC folder. Inside of there, we can create three different components. A card.jsx component, which is going to be used for our images. There we can run refce. We can create another one called form field dot jsx and again run refce inside of there and we can create our loader component loader dot jsx instead of this one you don't have to run refce rather down in the description inside of a github gist you can find that entire loader file you can copy it and then paste it right here as you can see this is simply an svg file that's going to allow us to have some loading animations Finally, we need to export all of these components from the components folder by creating a new index.js file. There, we need to import all of them one by one. So let's start to import card from card. Secondly, we can import the form field coming from that slash form field. And then finally, we can import the loader coming from that slash loader. Then we can export everything as one object that contains a card a form field, and a loader component. That's it. As you can see, there isn't a lot of pieces of the UI when it comes to this application. It is fairly minimalistic. But the main focus of this video is teach you how to work with DALI API, OpenAI's image generation API. With that said, we can close all of our components and go back to our homepage. Inside of which, we can now say import. That's going to be loader, card, and form field coming from dot dot slash components. There we go. Now we can use them in our UI. Inside of our home, we can immediately create two different states. That's going to be use state snippet, and let's call it loading and set loading. At the start, loading is going to be set to false. Later on, we'll also have to work with the posts. So let's create a new state called all posts, set all posts. And that's going to be equal to a use state that's going to start with a value of null. Great. 
Now let's focus on the return of our home component. First, we're going to create a section. That section is going to have a class name equal to max-w-7xl. So this is going to be a max width of about 80 rem. And let's also give it a margin x of auto. Inside of that section, we can create a div that's going to have an h1 inside of it. That h1 is going to say the community showcase. We can also give it a class name equal to font dash extra bold text dash inside of square brackets hash 222328. And we can give it a text dash 32 pixels like this. You can see the community showcase. Now we can also create a paragraph below it. That paragraph is going to have a class name equal to margin top two empty two text dash hash 666E75. And we can create text dash 14 pixels to make it just a bit bigger and provide a max dash W dash 500 pixels. Inside of there, we can say something like browse through a collection of imaginative and visually stunning images generated by DALI AI. Great. Now we can see that this text is a bit too small. So maybe if we go with something like 16 pixels, that's looking a bit better. Below the div containing the h1 and the p tag, we can create a new div. This div is going to have a class name equal to mt16 for margin top to divide it from the text above. There, we can render a self-closing form field component. For now, we won't provide any props to it. We're going to focus on that later on. Below that, we have to focus on loadings. So let's go below this div wrapping the form field and let's create another div. This div is also going to have a class name equal to MT, but this time 10 to divide it from the top content. And inside of there, we can open a dynamic block of code. We can check if we are loading. And in that case, we can render a div. That div is going to have a class name equal to flex, justify dash center and items dash center. Inside of there, we can render our self-closing loader component. Now, of course, we're getting an error because we used a ternary operator. That means that we have to provide the or part of the statement as well with a colon sign. So let's create a new pair of parentheses and let's render an empty React fragment. That's going to immediately fix it. Now, if we want to see that loader, for now, we can simply set the loading to true. And there we go. You can see how that's going to look like. We can bring it back to false and we can continue with our layout if we do have any images to show. While displaying images, they can be from our search or just generic images. So first, instead of a dynamic block of code, we have to check if we have something in the search text. Now, this is a field that we haven't yet created. So quickly scrolling up, we can create a new use state snippet called search text, set search text, and at the start, it's going to be set to an empty string. Now we can say search text and and meaning if there is any search text, then we can show an h2 that's going to have a class name equal to font dash medium text dash hash 666 E75. That's that grayish color we used before text dash XL to make it larger and MB of three for margin bottom. There, inside of that H2, we can say showing results for span. That span is going to have a class name equal to text dash hash 222328. That's that dark color. And there, we can render search text. There we go. Now, as you can see, we don't see that because the search text is empty. But if we add something like ABC right now, we can see showing results for ABC. Later on, we're going to dynamically update this. Great. With that said, below our search text, we're going to actually render through our images. So let's go below this part right here, render a div. 
and that div is going to have a class name equal to grid. Now, in most cases, I would recommend using CSS Flixbox instead of using CSS Grid. But when you literally have a grid of images, as we will have soon, that's one of the only times when I would recommend using Grid over Flex. So yes, let's proceed with the grid. On large devices, we want to say grid dash calls dash four, meaning four columns on grid. But on small devices, we want to say grid dash calls dash three. And then on extra small devices, we want to set the grid dash calls dash two. Finally, otherwise, we're going to have grid dash calls dash one, and the gap between images is going to be three. Inside of there, we want to render our new component, which we're going to create on top of our page. That component is going to be called render cards. So we can say const render cards is equal to, that's going to be a generic React functional component. And it's going to look like this. There, we want to accept two different parameters to it. The first one is going to be data, and the second one is going to be title. Then we want to check if data question mark dot length is greater than zero. In that case, we want to return data dot map. Right here, we want to map over each post or image. And then we want to return a self closing card component. That card is going to have a key equal to post dot underscore ID. And we want to spread out all of the other post properties. So dot 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 post. Just to modify this so you can see it a bit better, I'm going to put it in a new line. And there we go. So if data is greater than zero, then we want to map over the data and we want to render all of the cards while passing all of the post data to each individual card. Otherwise, we simply want to return the title. So we can say return h2, that's going to be a class name equal to mt-5 for margin top, font-bold, text-hash, 6469ff, text-xl, and uppercase. Inside of there, we can simply render the title that we pass dynamically into this component through props. Now, in just a couple of seconds, you'll see the reason why we created this separate functional component, primarily for reusability. Going down right here inside of our div with the grid, we can now check if search text exists. And if it does, we want to render cards and we want to pass the data to it. That data is going to be searched results. So results corresponding to our image search. And if there are no search results, we want to provide a title equal to no search results found. Now, if you're not trying to search for something, if we are just trying to render all of the posts, then we can add an or and we can again render cards self closing. The data that we pass are going to be all posts and the title can be no posts found if there really are no posts. Now, here is the most important thing to figure out. This data right now, we simply passed it as a string. But later on, this is going to be an array of actual data. So right now, it looks like we have an error. And I'm guessing it's complaining because we passed a string, and it's trying to iterate over the string right here. So what we can do is for now, we can pass an empty array to both of these pieces of data. That's going to look like this. There we go. No posts found. So hopefully now you can see why we decided to create a new render cards functional component so that we can call it two times, but pass it two entirely different sets of props. Of course, this is going to make more sense once we actually have real data for all posts and real data for searched posts. With that said, we are entirely done for the representation part of our homepage. As I told you, it's going to be fairly simple. But of course, the majority of the work actually comes down to creating the logic. So what we can do as the next step 
is move to the create post page. Implement all the UI to generate different images. And then we're going to move to the back inside of our application where we're going to send the prompt from the front end to the back end and ask the AI to generate it. Great. So we can go back to app, we can open up our create post page, and we can get started. Inside of our create post page, we're going to use a use state hook later on. So let's import it. We're going to use the use navigate hook coming from react-router-dom. We're going to also import an icon called preview coming from dot slash assets. We're going to also import inside of curly braces, get random prompt coming from dot slash utils. As you can see right now, we're getting an error because utils don't exist, but we're going to implement them really soon. And then when it comes to the actual layout, we're going to import the form field and loader components coming from, of course, dot, dot slash components. With that said, let's look into what these utils should be. So inside of our source folder, we can create a new folder called utils. Inside of the utils, we can create a new index.js file. Utility functions or utils for short, is a file where you can create different functions, which you can then reuse across your application. In our case, our utility function is going to be fairly simple. We first want to import surprise me prompts coming from dot dot slash constants. If you look into that, you can see that this is an array with about 50 different prompts we can generate. Then we need to create a function by saying export function, get random prompt, and it's going to accept a prompt as a parameter. Then we need to get a random index. And we're going to get that by using the math.floor function. Then we want to use the math.random function. And we want to multiply that by surprise me prompts dot length. Essentially, we're getting a random index from 1 to 49. Then we can retrieve that random prompt right here by saying random prompt, go into surprise me prompts and use this random index. Now we can simply return the random prompt. But there's one more tweak or an improvement that we can do. And that is to implement a check to make sure that we don't get the same random prompt two times in a row or three. That is incredibly unlikely, but still we can improve that. So we can say if random prompt is triple equal to prompt, then we can just recall the get random prompt function. Great. With that said, we can now go back in our create post and we now have access to this get random prompt function, which just to repeat what it does. Every time that we call it, it's going to give us a different random prompt that a user can use to generate the AI image. Great. Now inside of our create post, we're going to first initialize the const navigate hook by saying const navigate is equal to use navigate. This is going to allow us to navigate back to the homepage once the post is created. Then we can create a new use state field called form and set form. At the start, that's going to be an object containing a property of name, which is an empty string, a property of prompt, which is also an empty string, and the actual photo right here, which is an empty string. Now, we'll also have to manage two different states. The first state is going to be a use state, and we can call it generating IMG and set generating IMG. At the start, that's going to be set to false. This is going to be used while we are making contact with our API and while we're waiting to get back the image. And the second one is going to be just the general loading. So we can say const loading, set loading, and that's going to be equal to use state false. Now we have all of the states that we need and we can start creating the UI UX of our application. We're going to exchange this div into an HTML5 semantic section tag and give it a class name equal to max dash W dash seven XL taking 80 rem of the width. And also we're going to give it an MX of auto 
inside of there, we're going to create a div. And within that div, we want to do a similar thing we've done inside of our home page. So quickly, we can jump into the home page. And there, we can copy this entire first div containing the h1 and the p tag. Let's paste it right here over this div. And we're going to change just a couple of things. Instead of the community showcase, we can say create. And instead of browse through a collection of imaginative images, we can say create imaginative and visually stunning images through DALI AI and share them with the community. Great. As you can see, now we can differentiate the showcase page and the create page. And we are ready to start creating the form through which we'll be able to generate them. So just below this div, we can create a form component. That form is going to have a class name equal to MT-16 and max-w-3xl. Finally, we can give it an onSubmit property that's going to be equal to handle submit. This function is going to be ran once we click a submit button. Now, of course, we have to create a version of that handle submit function. So that's going to be a basic arrow function. For now, we can leave it empty. Inside of that form, we can create another div. And that div is going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, and gap dash five. This is just going to be used to position our form fields inside of our form. So let's create our form fields. That's going to be a self-closing form field. It's going to have a couple of different properties. It's going to have a label name, which for the first one, it's going to be your name. Then it's going to have a type, which is going to be text. It's going to have a name, which is going to be name. It's going to have a placeholder equal to, in this case, let's do John Doe, since it's a name field. It's going to have a value, which is going to be equal to form.name and a handle change field, which is going to be equal to handle change. This handle change is a function that we haven't yet created. So let's create it right here below our handle submit. Const handle change is equal to an arrow function that has an event or E as its first and only parameter. Now we can duplicate this form field one more time below. Instead of your name, we can say prompt. Name is going to be prompt as well. And then we can pick one of many prompts we have in our constants as a placeholder. So right here, let's choose something like a plush toy robot sitting against a yellow wall. And we can paste it right here in the placeholder. Value is going to be form.prompt. Handle change is going to be the same, but right here we can provide the additional parameter called is surprise me. Based on this little prop, we can know whether we want to show an additional button with this form field. And then of course we have to provide the handle surprise me, which is going to be equal to a function of that same name. This function for now can also be left empty and we can create it right here. Const handle surprise me. This one is simply going to call our utility function to ensure that we always get a new prompt. Great. With that said, we can now only see two generic texts that say form field, but let's actually control click the form field component to get into it and to start developing it. To start developing our form field, let's put our browser to the end right here so we can see what we are creating. And let's start by wrapping everything in a div and then creating another div right inside of it. That div is going to have a class name equal to flex items-center, gap-2, and margin bottom or MB-2. You can see our fields disappeared and now we're ready to create the actual field. Before we do that, we have to get access to all of the prompt that we passed into our form field component. We can do that by destructuring everything from props. And by everything, I mean label name, type, name, placeholder, 
value handle change is surprise me and handle surprise me. There we go. Now we have all the data we need to work with. First, we're going to focus on a little button that says surprise me. And that button is made up of a label. That label has to have an HTML4, in this case, a name and a class name equal to block text-sm, font-medium, and text-gray-900. Finally, inside of there, we can render label name. As you can see, now we have your name and we have the prompt. But below that label, only for form fields that have the is surprise me prop turned on, there we can render a button. This button is going to be of a type is equal to button. It's going to have an on click property equal to handle surprise me. And it's going to have a class name equal to font dash semi bold text dash XS for extra small BG dash hash EC EC F one padding Y of one for top and bottom and padding X of two for left and right rounded dash five pixels and text dash black. Finally, inside of that button, we can say surprise me. If we save that, you can see a little button appear right here. For now, it's not doing anything, but soon enough, it will. Finally, let's create that form field input we've been talking about for so long. Below this div, we can create a self-closing input tag. Inside of there, we can provide it a type equal to a dynamic type we're passing into this component, an ID equal to name, a name equal to name to differentiate them. Then we can give it a placeholder equal to placeholder, value equal to value, on change equal to handle change, and required. If we save this, you can see two ugly looking form fields. So the last thing we have to do is apply a class name equal to BG dash gray dash 50. That's already going to change it a bit border dash gray dash 300 text dash gray dash 900 text dash SM for small rounded dash LG to make it rounded on focus ring dash and let's apply a hash 6469 FF. That's that blue color. Also on focus, but this time modifying the border to the same color 4649 FF. We want to give it an outline none, a block property, W dash full, and padding dash three. And with this, our fields are looking just a bit better. We have a lot of border properties, but I forgot to apply a border. So now this is looking even better. You can see that they're matching the overall design. Great. With that said, we're done with the form field component so we can get back to our create post. Of course, these fields are not yet functional, but they soon will be. Below our second form field, still in the same div, we can create another div. This div is going to have a class name equal to relative. What we're doing right now is we're creating a place where an AI generated image will be shown, but also we will show a preview of the image in case it hasn't been already generated. So we're creating a container for that little spot right now. We're going to put it as a relative, give it a BG dash gray dash 50, give it a border as well as border dash gray dash 300 text dash gray dash 900 text dash SM for small rounded dash LG on focus. We want to give it a ring dash blue dash 500. And on focus, we also want to give it a border dash blue dash 500 width is going to be 64. P is going to be three for padding, 
h is going to be 64 as well. Flex, justify, center, and items dash center. Based on this info, we can now show if we tap into the dynamic block of code, form.photo. So if there is a form.photo, then we can show a self-closing image tag that's going to have a source equal to form.photo, an alt tag equal to form.prompt, and we can also give it a class name equal to w-full, h-full, and object-contain. But if we don't have a form.photo, then we can show a self-closing image tag that's going to have a source equal to preview image. An alt is going to be preview. And class name is going to be w-9 out of 12, h-9 out of 12, and object-contain, as well as opacity-40. Now, if we save this, I think you can see what I meant when I told you that this is where the real AI generated image will go. But for now, we simply have a preview placeholder. Now, there also has to be a loader when the image is being generated. So below this dynamic block of code, we can open another dynamic block of code and say generating image and end. So if that is happening, then we want to show a div. And within that div, we're going to render the loader. But we have to position that loader so that it fits nicely right here by giving it a class name equal to absolute inset dash zero, z of zero, flex, justify dash center, items dash center, and then bg dash rgba zero zero zero, and then 0 0.5. That's for the opacity, and then rounded dash lg. Now, if we save this, nothing really is going to happen because we're not generating an image right now. But if we were, just to show you, I can turn on the generating image to true, and then that's going to look like this. Wonderful. Now, going back, we of course need a way for us to submit the image. So going below this div, this div, and then one more div, just above the form, we need to create a new div. This div is going to have a class name equal to mt-5 flex gap-5 and its only purpose is going to be to wrap our button, our submit button. So this button is going to be of a type is equal to button. On click is going to be generate image. Of course, this is a new function we haven't yet created. So at the top, we can add it right here above handle submit, const generate image. There we go. As I said, the logic for all this will be implemented soon. But for now, let's finish the layout. We can also give it a prompt or a text that's going to say something like, if generating image, then we can say generating dot dot dot. Otherwise, we can say generate. And as you can see, it's saying generating right now. Because it's not image, we just had it as IMG. So generate IMG. Right now, it says generating because we reference the function instead of our use state field. So that should have been generating IMG. This is our field to track whether we are currently generating. And of course, this doesn't look like a button now. So let's give it a class name equal to text dash white bg dash green dash 700 font dash medium rounded dash md text dash small or sm w dash full for full width on small devices w dash auto padding x of five padding y of 2.5 and then text dash center this is going to generate a wonderful full-sized button to generate our image. Now, once we generate it, we also have to submit it. So below this div, we're going to create another div. And that div is going to have a class name equal to mt-10. Inside of there, we want to render a p tag. And that p tag is going to say 
once you have created the image you want, you can share it with others in the community. There we go. Now this is looking a bit ugly. So let's simply apply a class name equal to empty dash two to divide it from the top text dash hash 666 E75 and text dash 14 pixels. There we go. So this is looking just a bit better. Finally, let's create that last button. Below the P tag, we can render a button that's going to have a type equal to submit. It's going to check if we are currently loading. So if loading, then we can say something like sharing dot dot dot. Otherwise, we can say share with the community. There we go. Now this is not looking like a button. So let's give it a class name of empty dash three for margin top. Now let's give it a property of text dash white BG dash hash 6469 FF. That's that blue color font dash medium rounded dash MD text dash small or SM W dash full on small devices W dash auto padding X of five for horizontal padding padding Y of 2.5 for vertical padding and then text dash center. And there we go. We have a beautiful share with a community button. Now, as you can see, we have been viewing our website in like one fourth of our full HD window and everything is looking great. But if we keep expanding it, it's still looking great. And it comes a bit more closer to the center of the screen for easier viewing. With that said, now is the time to implement the functionality of our fields so that we get ready to send that data over to the backend, which we're going to start creating really soon. So to do that, let's first make sure that we can actually type values in our form fields. We can do that by focusing on our handle change function. This handle change is simply going to take the event, the key press event, and it's going to call the set form state. There we want to spread the entire form and we want to update e.target.name, meaning that specific property with the newly created e.target.value, meaning the character we typed in. To make the syntax work, we have to close the bracket right here. So this is looking good to me. Now let's make the handle surprise me button work as well. There we need to get a random prompt const random prompt. And that's going to be incredibly easy because we have created a get random prompt function, which accepts a form that prompt to ensure we don't render the same one. Once we do that, we can simply call the set form state spread out the entire form and then update the prompt to be that random prompt. There we go. Now, if we click surprise me, you can see that it keeps changing from a lot of different interesting things that our DALI AI image generation tool can create. And you can also type in your name. So once we have our name, once we have our prompt, we are ready to generate our image. So that is the generate image button right here. This is the button that's going to call our backend, which of course doesn't yet exist, which finally brings us to the point where we absolutely need to develop our backend as the front end is basically begging for it. So what we can do is close our create post, close our app.js, and we can get started with creating our fully custom Node.js MongoDB and ExpressJS backend that's going to be interacting directly with the DALI OpenAI API. To get started with creating our backend, we can collapse all of our files and folders and create a new folder right in the root of our directory. Let's call it server. Now we can go to view and then terminal, and you can press this little icon right here to split the terminal in half. That's going to allow us to have both front end and the back end open. We need to CD dot dot to move from the client side all the way to CD server to move to our server directory. There, we want to run a command npm init, 
dash y. This is going to initialize an empty package.json file. By empty, I mean right now we have no dependencies there. So what we can do is we can first change the script to start. We want to add a script to start our backend and it's going to run nodeman index. Nodeman is a package that ensures that our backend is always running no matter how many changes we make to it. And finally, we have to install all the necessary dependencies. We can do that by opening the terminal and running a command npm install cloudinary, which we're going to use to store our images, course for cross origin requests, dot env for storing secrets, express, mongoose, nodeman, and open AI. And again, make sure that you are inside of our server directory and press enter. Great. All of the packages have been installed and we are almost ready to run our application. But first we have to create an index.js file. Also, we'll be working with modules, ES6 plus imports and exports and not old module that requires. So to enable that, we have to add one line right here below the description, which is type is equal to module. This is going to allow us to use the same import and export statements as in React. And with that said, we can close our package.json and we can create a new file called index.js. Inside of here, we can import the libraries and packages we'll be using. Tools such as express coming from express. We'll also need to import everything as .env from .env. Then we're going to import course from course. That's going to be all when it comes to external packages we'll be using. Later on, we'll have some internal ones as well. But for now, let's set up our .env by running the .env.config and calling it as a function. This line allows us to pull our environment variables from our .env file, which we'll create soon. Then we can initialize our express application by running const app is equal to express and we call it as a function. We can add additional middlewares to it by saying app.use and then we pass course, which we also call as a function. Then we can also add an additional middleware, in this case express.json that accepts an option object where we can set the limit to 50 megabytes. And we are ready to create our first route, app.get simply forward slash, our root route. It's going to be an async function where we have a request and a response. And there we simply want to res.send. That's going to be not hello world, but rather we can do something like, let's put it right here, hello from Dali. There we go. So this is just going to ensure that we know that our application is running once we visit the URL of our server. Great. Now we have the base of our express application set up, but we need a way for us to run it. To do that, we can create a function called const start server is equal to an async function where we call app.listen. And let's say that the port of our application is 8080. As the second parameter, we can provide a callback function that's going to call a console.log and we can say server has started on port HTTP colon forward slash forward slash localhost 8080. There we go. And we can immediately call our start server function. Great. With this done, if we open up our terminal, we can now run npm start. And that's going to run our nodeman index command and run our server on localhost 8080. If you open it up in your browser, you should be able to see hello from Dali, which means that everything we've made so far works perfectly. Now, of course, we'll have to add some complexity to this backend. We'll have to connect it to MongoDB. We'll have to connect it to OpenAI API as well. So let's do everything step by step. Let's first create a function that's going to connect our application to MongoDB. 
So we can create a new folder inside of our server called MongoDB. And then inside of there, we can create a new file called connect.js. There we can import mongoose from mongoose. We can also create a function const connect db is equal to, it is a regular arrow function that accepts a URL. And then we want to call mongoose and call a dot set function. And we want to set strict query to true. This option that we just set is going to be useful when working with search functionality later on. For now, let's also connect our database, which is the more important part. So we can say mongoose.connect. We're going to pass a URL or a URI string right here. And then we can call a dot then on it. There, we can simply console log mongodb connected, or we can add a dot catch with an error where we can simply console log the error. Finally, we can export default connect db so that we can import it inside of our index.js. Inside of here, we can now import connect db from dot slash mongodb forward slash connect. And now before we do app that listen, we want to connect to mongodb. This can fail. So if it fails, we can create a try and catch block. We can say connect DB. And then we want to pass a process dot env dot mongodb underscore URL. This is going to be a special URL of our mongodb atlas database. Now, if it succeeds, then we want to run our application on localhost 8080. If that is not the case, we can simply console.log the error. There we go. So now let's put this nicely. Let's save our application and let's open up our terminal. As you can see, our app has crashed. And that's because this variable right here, process.env.mongodb URL, is entirely empty. We haven't yet added our MongoDB Atlas URL. So let's make a connection to Mongo right now. You can do that by visiting mongodb.com forward slash atlas forward slash database. It is their multi-cloud online database and it is entirely free. So click try free. And then in here, you'll have to create your account or sign up with Google. In this case, I'm going to sign up with Google. And after you do that, you'll see your organization and you can create a new project. We can give it a project name, something like DAL E. There we go. And next, we can set the permissions to project owner since we'll be the only ones using it. And that's going to bring us to database deployments. You can add your current IP address right here and we can build a database. You can create one for free. While the free database is selected, you can choose a provider and you can choose a server that's closest to you and you can click create cluster. Then you'll have to choose from pictures of crosswalks or something else and we can create it. Wonderful. So cluster is being created, which is going to allow us to start uploading AI generated images into our database. While that is happening, you can go to database access. And there we go. Our cluster has finished provisioning. Let's go to network access. Make sure that your IP address is added right there. And then we can go to database. You can click connect. And then you can enter your username and password. And you can choose a connection method. In this case, we want to connect it to our app. So that's the second step right there. And you can see your string right here. So you can copy that string. You can open up the file explorer in the code and you can create a new .env file. There, you can start typing mongodb underscore URL is equal to a string, and then you can pass this mongodb string. Now, as you can see, your username is going to be pre-filled, but you'll have to answer your password manually. In my case, it's 123123a, and that should work. So once again, while you were creating that user, you entered your username 
and password. So make sure to add your password right in here for everything to work. Great. Every time we update our .env, we'll have to restart our server. So press Control C, Y, and then npm start one more time. This is going to restart it. And apparently that breaks the application again. So it looks like we meant to import dot slash mongodb connect.js. And let's see if it did that. We did just connect. This would have worked in React, but it doesn't work in Node. So let's fix that. And there we go. Server has started on port 8080, mongodb connected. Wonderful. So our connection with MongoDB is successful, and now we are ready to proceed with the next step, which is creating a model for our post or a structure of how that post is going to look like. So inside of MongoDB, create a new folder called models. And inside of there, create a new post.js file. There we can import mongoose from mongoose and we can start creating our new post schema by saying const post with a capital P is equal to new mongoose.schema. We call it as a function and pass an object. There you can add a name, which is going to be type of string with a capital S like this, and the required is set to true. We can duplicate this two more times then we're going to have a prompt. And finally, we're going to have a photo. And all of these are going to be of a type string and required true. Finally, we have to create a model out of that schema. Const post schema is equal to mongoose.model. And then we pass a name for that model or a schema of post. And then we pass the schema we created post right here. Finally, we need to export default post schema. Now we can use it when generating new posts. Wonderful. And with that, we're done with the entire MongoDB side of things. Now we can focus on creating the routes for our backend application. So let's create a new folder called routes. Inside of there, we're going to create two types of routes. First one are going to be post routes.js. And the second one is going to be dali routes.js. Now that we have created both of these files, we can go back to index and we can import them right here in the index.js file. Just at the top, we can import them by saying import post routes coming from dot slash routes forward slash post routes.js. We can duplicate that and we can repeat the process for dali routes. There we go. And then to use them in our application, we have to also add them to the middleware right here. So below our app.use express JSON, we can say app.use forward slash API forward slash v1 forward slash post. And then we can render post routes. We can duplicate that and we can do DALI. So essentially, what we've done is created API endpoints that we can connect, that we can hook onto from our front end side. Of course, these routes are currently completely empty. So now our job is to add additional routes that we can call from the front end. First, we can start with imports for both of these files. So we can import express from express. We can also import everything as .env from .env, allowing us to use environment variables. Then we can import v2 as cloudinary from cloudinary. And we can import our post model. So import post from dot dot slash mongodb forward slash models forward slash post .js. And don't forget that dot .js. Finally, we can call the .env dot config to make sure that our environment variables are indeed getting populated. And finally, we can create a new instance of the router. Const router is equal to express.router with a capital R. Now we can copy that entire thing and we can move to DALI routes and paste it right here. 
express is still going to be needed, dot env is going to be needed. But instead of Cloudinary, here we will be working with OpenAI API. So we can import configuration and OpenAI API. That's coming from OpenAI. Let's fix a typo right here. We don't need to import the post right here, but we do need to set up the router. Great. So now we have the baseline for all of the files set up. I'm going to close everything and just go back to index to recap what we've done so far. We've created a simple instance of our backend API that simply has one route so far where we can verify that our application is working. Then we have also started our server and we have connected it to MongoDB by passing a specific MongoDB URI query for our MongoDB Atlas cluster. Then we have added post routes and DALI routes right here. I noticed that I misspelled it. So this right here must be DALI routes for everything to work. Great that we caught that. And finally, now is our turn to start adding post routes, which are going to be used for creating the posts and retrieving the posts. But before that, we have to enter also our DALI routes, which are going to be used to generate the data from the API maybe the most important part of this video. So that's going to be the exact next thing that we're going to do. Let's get started with generating our images from OpenAI DALI API. To connect to this powerful API, we're of course gonna need an API key. To get the key, go to openai.com and press the API button in the nav bar. Then click get started and create your account or log in. There, you'll be greeted by OpenAI's dashboard. Right here, they have a lot of quick start tutorials and examples, also different applications that you can build. Now that we're here, we can expand our browser, click JavaScript Mastery or your name right here, and then click View API Keys. There, you can create a new secret key and make sure to store it securely because you won't be able to view it again. Once you do that, you can go to the Explorer, to the .env file, and then add it right there. We'll add it like this, above the MongoDB URL, open AI underscore API underscore key is equal to this string right here. Once you do that, just remember, you'll have to reload your terminal. We're gonna do that later, as we implement more changes, and we can utilize that environment variable. The way you set it up is you create a new variable called const configuration, and that's equal to new configuration. You call it as a function and provide an object as the first and only parameter. There, you can set the API key to be equal to process.env openai underscore API underscore key. And then you create an instance of OpenAI by saying new OpenAI API, and then you pass in that configuration where you entered your API key. To test this router properly, we can first add a demo route by saying router.route, and then we can add just a forward slash. There we can say dot get, so this is a get route where we have a rec and a res, Make sure that this is inside of parentheses like this, rec and res. And then we can simply open up a function block. Instead of here, we can say res.send hello from DALI and we can test it out. So now let's rerun our application. Let's see if everything is working properly. It seems like we have an error. It cannot find DALI routes.js. So let's see if we spelled it properly, going back to the index, DALI routes from dot slash route, DALI routes dot JS. This is looking good to me. Most likely we forgot to export the router, so it cannot find it. So what we have to do is at the bottom, we have to say export default router. And you need to repeat this thing for the post routes as well. Finally, we can rerun our application or never mind, it fixed itself. So now if we go to localhost 8000 and we go to forward slash API forward slash v1 
forward slash post, if I'm not mistaken, we get cannot get API we want post. So let's check what API did we use. We used forward slash API forward slash v1 forward slash post. And then right here, yeah, we didn't do the post routes yet. We did the DALI routes, my bad. So right here, if we type DALI, we get hello from DALI, which means that this route that we created right here works great. Now we have to add a real DALI route, the route that's going to make a call to the OpenAI DALI API. And based on our prompt, it's going to return a real AI generated image. We can do that by saying router dot route. That's going to be just forward slash, but this time it's going to be a post request. There we get a rec and a res. And really important aspect of this is you have to make it a sync because it will take some time. Then we can open up a try and catch block and we can get the prompt from rec.body. This is gonna come from our front end side, the prompt that we create. It's going to be this one right here. So going back to our application, we have to generate that image. And we can do that by saying const AI response is equal to await openai.create image. We can pass an object with options. We can pass in the prompt, pass in n1, meaning one image. We can pass in a size equal to a string of 1024 times 1024. And we can set a response underscore format to be equal to b64 underscore json. Great. And we of course have to add a comma right here. Great. So now that we have this AI response, we need to get the image out of it. And that's going to look like this. Const image is equal to AI response dot data dot data one more time, zero dot and then b64 underscore JSON. Great. Finally, once we get that image, we can say res that status of 200 dot JSON. And then we're going to pass in a photo, which is going to be equal to the image. And that's it. We're getting that image and we're sending it back to the front end. Finally, if something doesn't go right, we can run console.log error. And we can also res that status of 500 dot send error question mark dot response dot data dot error dot message. Great. Now, if we save this, our route is finalized. The only thing we have to do is go back to our front end and call our back end to see if it's going to bring anything back. To do that, we can close all of our currently open files, go back to the client side, go to the source, to our pages, and then create post page. And there we can now make a call to the backend that you have created from our generate image function. We can do that by first checking if we have a prompt. So if form dot prompt, then we can open up a try and catch block. And now we're working back on the front end so I can switch it to our Vite application. There, we first want to set generating IMG loading state to be true because we have started the generation. Then we want to get back the response. So we say const response from await fetch. And then we have to pass the API. That's going to be HTTP colon forward slash forward slash local host 8080 forward slash API forward slash v1 forward slash DALI. And we have to provide a second parameter, which is an object of options. The most important option is method is set to post. And as you can notice, we have an await. So we need to add an async right here as well. Then you need to pass headers. Headers is an object where content dash type is equal to application forward slash JSON. Make sure to type this exactly as it is right here 
without typos. And finally, we can pass in the body. The body is going to be a stringified prompt. So we can say json.stringify prompt form dot prompt right here. And that is it. We're passing all of the needed data to our backend to then get back the response, which is going to be the AI generated image. To parse that data and to be able to see it, let's say const data is equal to await response.json. And once we got it, we can set it to the state by saying set form dot 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 form to spread other parameters. And then we're going to set the photo to be equal to a template string of data colon image forward slash JPEG semicolon base 64 comma and then dollar sign and curly braces data dot photo. So this is the way in which we're going to save and render our image. Finally, instead of the catch, we can alert an error if there is one. And then we can add a finally clause. So whatever happens, we want to set the loading state of set generating image to false. And then else, if we don't have a prompt, which is right here, in that case, we can add an alert saying, please enter a prompt. Now, if we save this and click generate, let's see what happens. Usually things never work on the first try, especially after we added a lot of code, but let's give it a shot. And then if it doesn't work, I'm going to show you how to debug it in real time. So here it goes. Generating. Okay. And it worked. Believe it or not, it worked on the first try. A man wanders through the rainy streets of Tokyo with bright neon signs, 50 millimeter lens. This is looking great. And this image was generated by AI. Now, before we share the image with the community, you can press surprise me a couple of more times and generate multiple images. So let's try one of a comic book cover of a superhero wearing headphones. There we go. And now if you're not happy with the image, you can keep regenerating until you find the one that suits what you were looking for. Great. This one is much better, but keep in mind, you don't necessarily have to use just prompts from the surprise me button. You can type whatever you want to. So let's try a beautiful nature photo, 4k ultra realistic, and let's click generate. There we go. This is wonderful. And now we are ready to share with the community. But now at this point, that doesn't yet work. We only created the API endpoints for generating these AI images. But now we have to create post routes to actually upload the image and the prompt and the post itself to our AI image sharing social media platform. That is where the Mern stack comes in. That is what makes this application a full stack Mern application. So we can close all of the currently open files, go to server routes, and then post routes, and we can get started with implementing our almost crud like functionality to get started with our post routes. We'll have to set up an account on Cloudinary. Cloudinary is going to host our images for us so we can retrieve them later on once we submit them and make our application so much faster. To create an account with Cloudinary, you can go to cloudinary.com. Let's expand our browser right here and let's click get started. Right here, you can sign up using email, Google, or GitHub. And after you create your account, this is what you should see. If this is not what you're seeing right now, you might need to create a new account as they might have changed some things. Then you can move to dashboard and there are three different pieces of input that we need. First one is the cloud name. So you can copy it. We can go back to our .env and we can add a cloudinary underscore cloud underscore name is equal to, and then you can paste it. The second thing we need, we can duplicate this three times, is going to be cloudinary API key. So we can put it here. And the last thing is the API secret. Great. So now let's copy the API key, paste it right here. 
and let's copy the API secret and paste it right here as well. Great. Now we have everything we need from Cloudinary and that's it. We can go back to our application. We can close our dot ENV. And remember, whenever you change it, you have to stop your terminal from running by pressing control C and then Y and then rerun it again. Great. And now we are ready to start creating our post routes. But let's utilize those keys that we just got. So we can say cloudinary dot config. We can pass in an object that's going to contain a cloud underscore name that's going to be process.env.cloudinary underscore cloud underscore name. And we can duplicate that two times. For the second one, we need API underscore key, and we can change this to API underscore key. And the last one is going to be API underscore secret. And right here, we can change this to API underscore secret. Great. Now our Cloudinary is configured and we'll be able to upload our images there. Now we can move on to creating post routes. We're going to have two different routes. The first one is going to be a get route to get all posts. And then the second one is going to be a create a post route. So let's create it. That's going to be router.route forward slash, or you can simply say router.get. And then we can say dot get async. And then we can provide a function that's going to have a request and response as parameters. And we can close it like so. Now we can duplicate this function below and we can put it as a post route. So the only thing we have to change is the verb from get to post. There we go. Now let's first create a post route so we can submit our post. First, we have to get all of the data we're sending from the front end. So we can destructure it by saying const name, prompt, and photo. And that's going to be equal to rec that body, meaning we're sending it from the front end. Then we need to upload the photo URL to Cloudinary. Const photo URL is equal to await Cloudinary dot uploader dot upload and then we pass in the photo as the parameter. This is coming from the front end. We're uploading it to Cloudinary, and then we get Cloudinary optimized URL. Now that we have all of the data and the newly updated photo URL, we can say const new post is equal to await post with a capital P dot create. We pass in an object that has a name, a prompt, and also has a photo equal to photo URL dot URL. There we go. These four lines are going to create a new post in our database. Once we create it, we can say res that status of 201. And then we can pass in dot JSON success is equal to true. And then data is equal to new post. Finally, we can wrap everything inside of a try and catch block. So I'm going to copy everything we have right here. I'm going to write a try and catch block, paste everything in the try. And then in the catch, we're going to res that status of 500 dot JSON, where success is set to false. And then error, or rather the message is equal to error. There we go. So this is looking great. Also, it seems like the prompt is unused. It looks like I misspelled it right here. So if we spell it properly, everything is good. Now, keep in mind that what I've showed you here is the best possible approach and the actual practice of how you'll be working with databases and file storage and creating new documents in your databases in real life applications. We didn't want to simply take a shortcut and store images in base 64 URL. That would be great for a couple of images, but as we scale, we'll have to provide storage for all of those images. And that is exactly why before creating a new instance of a document, we are uploading the image to Cloudinary that stores it and gives us back a photo URL. Based on that info, we then create a new post in the database 
by only sharing the URL. Great. With that said, create a post route is done, but we wouldn't be able to see the posts if we don't have get all posts route. Implementing this is going to be even simpler. We can create a try and catch block and say const posts is equal to await post.find and we can pass an empty object as the first and only parameter. Then we can say res.status of 200.json. We can pass an object containing the success property set to true and data set to posts. That's it, returning all the posts. We can duplicate this, add it to the catch, change the error message to 500, success to false, and finally, message to be equal to error. There we go. So everything is looking great right now. With that, our post routes are done and with them, our entire backend. Now we should be able to generate images and then, and then share them with the community. I entered my name, I'm gonna add a prompt and I'm gonna click generate image is being generated as we speak and we can see a great image. Now, if you're not satisfied with it, you can modify your prompt or you can just click regenerate. So it's going to give you another instance of that same image. In this case, I decided to do both. There we go. This is a great looking fish. So let's share it with the community. Again, this is the first time we're clicking this. So it's possible it's not going to work. Now, before we share it with the community, we of course have to go back to the front end and implement the share button. So we go to source, pages, create post. And as you can see, the generate prompt is done. We did it before, but now the last function we have to implement is handle submit. Before we begin, we're going to make this function asynchronous as we'll be doing some data fetching. Then we're going to get the first and only parameter of event. That's going to be a submit event. And then we want to call event.prevent default. This is going to ensure that the browser doesn't automatically reload our application. Then we need to check if we have the form and the photo before we submit. So we need to check if form.prompt and form.photo exists. If that is the case, we can set the loading to be set to true. We are starting with the process. Then we can open up a try and catch block. With the catch, we get the error. And then in the catch, we can start with the data fetching. And then in the try, we can call our post image route. We can do that by saying const response is equal to await fetch. We have to pass the URL HTTP colon forward slash forward slash localhost 8080 forward slash API forward slash V1 forward slash post. Then you want to pass a second parameter, which is an object containing the method equal to post headers equal to an object that's going to contain a content type equal to application JSON make sure to spell it exactly as it is spelled right here. And then finally, we're going to provide our body, which is going to be equal to json.stringify. And then we're going to simply pass the entire form. Wonderful. As you know, in our last file post routes, right here to rec that body is where we are getting that entire post. Great. So now that we're doing that, we're getting back the response. And then once we get it, we can await response.json. That means that we got it successfully. And finally, we can navigate to forward slash, go back to home to be able to see our image. Now, if something goes wrong, we can simply alert the error. And finally, this is going to happen either way. We can set the loading to be set to false. This is it. Now, if we save this file, our function is fully done. And we also have to add just one more check. If we don't have the form that prompt or form that photo, we can create an else right here. And then we can alert, please enter a prompt and generate an image. That's it.
Now we still have our great pufferfish right here. So let's simply click share with the community. It says sharing. I'm guessing something is happening and we are brought back to our homepage. And that could have only happened if the response was successful because the navigate is after the await. Wonderful. Now, the reason why it says no posts found is because we haven't implemented the get route in our front end. So let's go back to the homepage. And right here, we have to make a call to get all of the posts. To make that call, we're going to create a new use effect hook. Use effect is called at the start once the component loads. This one will only be called at the start, meaning we're going to left the dependency array as empty. There, we want to create a function called const fetch posts is equal to an async function. And then immediately after, we want to call it fetch posts. Inside of this function, we first want to set the loading to be set to true because we are instantly doing something. Then we want to open up a try and catch block like this. Catch has the error, don't forget. And then also we can give it a finally. You already know what it goes into finally. There we stop the loading. Now, what do we do in the try? Well, it's going to be similar to what we did in the post route. We want to get a new response by saying equal to await fetch HTTP colon forward slash forward slash localhost 8080 forward slash API forward slash V1 forward slash post. Then as the second parameter, we pass in an object where the method is get and the headers are going to be content type application JSON. Now we have to check if the response is okay. And we can do that by saying if response that okay, then we can get the result by saying const result is equal to await response.json. Finally, once we have the result, we can set all posts to be equal to result.data.reverse. The reason why we're reversing it is because we want to show the newest posts at the top. Great. Now let's also alert the error if there is one and save the file. Still, it says no posts and let's check our no posts clause right here. So that is because the array data is equal to nothing. So inside of here, we can pass all posts. Let's do that all posts and save. And there we go. We have one post card, which is our fish card. Now to be able to showcase it, of course, we have to dive into the render cards and we have to implement the card component, which is right here. So far we were simply looping through them, but the card itself still remained empty. After implementing our card component, it should look something like this. Some cards are going to be huge. Some are going to be a bit smaller, but after you hover over them, you should see a prompt that a user used to generate that AI generated image, a user that created it and a download button. Great. So let's go ahead and implement it right away. To get started with implementing our card, we can import the download icon coming from dot dot slash assets. And we can also import download image coming from dot dot slash utils. This is a second utility function we can create. So you can control click the utils to go into it. And then below our get random prompt, you can export async function download image. There you can pass the underscore ID as the first parameter and the photo as the second one. There we'll be using the file saver library that we installed before. So at the top, we can import file saver that's coming from file dash saver. The only thing you have to do to implement this function is say file saver dot save as photo. And then you pass in the string to download. That's going to be download dash underscore ID and then dot JPEG. Great. 
Now we can go back to the card and we have access to this download image function. Our card is also receiving some parameters. It's receiving the underscore ID, the name, the prompt, and also the photo. Now, how do I know that? Well, if we go back to home, you can see that we are iterating over these cards and we're spreading all of the values that each post has. Great. Now we can work to create the layout of that card. I'm going to collapse our browser just a bit and I'll open up the console to see where the error seems to be because we cannot see anything right now. It's download image, looks like I misspelled it. So if I go back to utils and copy the correct name, I can fix it right here and it should work. There we go. Now it says card. Let's actually create the look and feel of that card. First of all, we're gonna have a div that's going to have a class name equal to rounded-xl. It's going to be a group because we're gonna have multiple things inside of it. It's going to be relative and it's going to have a shadow-card. Finally, on hover, we're going to change the shadow to card hover and we're gonna provide a card class name. If we save this, we can see one huge card right here, or rather it's just a rectangle with a shadow. But once we add the image, everything is going to change. So we can add a self-closing image tag with a class name equal to w-full h-auto object-cover and rounded-xl. Then we can give it a source equal to photo and we can give it an alt tag equal to prompt. That's going to be dynamic as well. If we save that, we can see our wonderful image right here. Believe it or not, this image was generated by AI. That's pretty crazy, but now let's say we wanted to create a similar fish like this one. We don't know which prompt the user has entered to get this result. That's why we'll work on creating the prompt as well so that people can know what other people have used. Below this image, we can create a div and that div is going to have a class name equal to a special property of group-hover. Then we wanna make it into a flex. It's going to be a flex-call, a maximum height, meaning max-h-94.5%. I found this to work the best. It's going to be hidden, it's going to be absolute, and it's going to be shown at the bottom zero and left zero. Right zero as well. Finally, we want to set the BG dash hash 10131F and margin dash two, P dash four, rounded dash MD. This is going to provide an overlay. As you can see, once we hover, you can see that black box appear at the bottom. Now inside of there, we want to render a P tag that's going to render the prompt. If I save this, we should be able to see the text right here. Now let's style it a bit. Let's give it a class name equal to text-white, text-sm, overflow-y-auto, and prompt. If we save this, it's looking just a bit better. Now below that P tag, we're going to create a div and that div is going to have a class name equal to MT-5 for margin top, flex, justify dash between, items dash center, and gap dash two. That is a wrapper for all of the other elements we'll have inside of there, such as the name, the photo, and then later on the download. Inside of there, we can create a wrapper div for the smaller part, meaning just the photo and the name, there we can give it a class name equal to flex items dash center and gap dash two. And inside of there, we can create a div that's going to wrap our name. So there we can simply say name and then zero. That's where the name is hidden. If I save this, we should be able to see it right here. I can see just a, so that's not looking good. Meaning that's just the first letter. But based on this first letter, we're going to form that avatar. We're going to form that image that you can see right here. That's looking great. So let's do just that. 
by giving this div a class name equal to w-7 for width, h-7 for height, rounded-full, object-cover, bg-green-700, flex, justify-center, items-center, text-white, text-xs, and font-bold. If we save this and hover, you can see this great looking profile photo right here. Now below that, we can simply render a P tag and that P tag is going to render the entire name. But of course, let's give it a class name equal to text-white and text-sm. There we go. This is already looking so much better. I think this text is a bit too small, so maybe we can change the prompt text to text-md. Yep, this is looking great. Finally, let's add a button to download the image. We can create that button below this div right here with a gap two. That's going to be a button. It's going to have a type equal to button. It's going to have an on click property where we can have a callback function that's going to call the download image function. We need to provide the underscore ID as the first parameter and then the photo as the second one. We can also give it a class name equal to outline dash none bg dash transparent and border dash none. If we save this, we cannot see anything yet because we have to add something inside of the button. And that something is going to be an image. That image is going to have a source equal to download, an alt tag equal to download as well, and a class name equal to w dash six, h dash six, object dash contain, and invert. Now, if we save this and hover over here, we have this beautiful download button and it's fully functional as well. If you click it, immediately it downloads the image and you can see it in its full glory. This is a 1024 by 1024 image. And once again, it was fully AI generated. An AI doesn't even know what a fish is, but it created it looking like this based on the given prompt. That is wonderful. Now, believe it or not, that is it when it comes to creating the layout of our card, which now means that if we expand our application, we have our wonderful showcase and we have successfully created this image from our create page, which essentially means that our entire application is fully done. Isn't this great? Now there's just one small part we still have to finalize and that's going to be the search. Trust me, keeping in mind everything we've done in this video, that's going to be an easy job. So let's go ahead and collapse our browser, close all of the currently open files, open up just the homepage, and let's focus on implementing the search. To implement the search, we can create a new function called const handle search change. That's going to take in an event as the first and only parameter. That's a key press event. And there we want to set search text to be equal to e.target.value. And then we want to search for something. Now we also want to add a debounce to that, meaning we don't want to filter out through everything for every single keystroke. We want to set out a timeout. And we can do that by creating the set timeout like this. It accepts a callback function, and then we can specify the response. In this case, we can do about 500 milliseconds when the function inside of it runs. Meaning if you type multiple characters at the same time, you're not going to make individual requests for every single character if they were typed all in this time frame. Now inside of here, we can say const search results is equal to all posts dot filter. The filter accepts a callback function where we get an item or a post. And then we want to check if item dot name dot to lower case dot includes and then search text dot to lower case. If that is the case, then we can show that post. We can filter it out, but we can also look into the prompt. So right here we can say or or item dot prompt 
dot to lowercase dot includes search text dot to lowercase. So this is our filtering prompt. Now that we have those search results, we can set searched results to be equal to search results, or rather we call it as a function right here. In this set search results, we can create as a new use state field. So at the top, we can add two additional use state fields. The first one is going to be searched results. There we go. And then set search results. Great. And then we can add a null right here at the start. And then finally, we can also create a new use state called search timeout and set search timeout at the start set to null. Now that we have that, we're successfully setting the search results and we can wrap all of this in a new timeout. So what we can do is set search timeout and then we can simply pass everything we have created right here inside of that function, like so. That allows us to also clear that timeout every time that we start typing something new. Now that we have this handle search change, we can pass it into our input right here. Let's search for it. That's going to be right here, our form field. So to this form field, we can pass a label name equal to search posts. We can pass a type equal to text, a name equal to text, a placeholder equal to search posts. We can also pass a value equal to search text. And then finally, we can pass the handle change equal to handle search change. And there we go. Now we have our search posts input. Finally, what we have to do is we have to render cards. If there is a search text, then we want to render through searched results, which is our new state field. Now, if I save this, you can still see our post. But if we search for something like Eiffel Tower, as you can see, no search results found. Now, just to see if the filtering is going to work properly, we can go ahead and create a new post. Right here, I entered my name and let's go with something like Eiffel Tower on a rainy day. Uh, let's do impressionist painting. Let's try that. Let's click generate. As the image is generating, let me spread this out. There we go. This is looking okay, I guess, but we want it to be more realistic as well. And let's fix the spelling. So sometimes you'll have to go through a couple of iterations until you get something you're happy with. There we go. This is much better. So finally, let's share it with the community. And there we go. Our beautiful AI generated image is here. And now if we search for fish, you can see the fish. And if we search for Eiffel, you can see the Eiffel Tower, which means that it works as well. We can even download it. You can open it up and you can see how well it is made. This one is done more like a painting, so you cannot see the level of detail, but still it is incredibly impressive. With that said, our OpenAI DALI clone application is now finalized. We can see the AI generated images and we can add additional images to our database. All of this is being done from the front end to the back end to Cloudinary to generating all of these images. So we're covering the full stack application essentially creating a social media platform where users can share their own AI generated images. With that said, as we always do on the JavaScript mastery, the next step is going to be to deploy this phenomenal application to the internet so that you can share it with your friends, put it in your portfolio and get a job. Before we deploy our application, we're first going to upload it to GitHub. That way we can keep track of it. You can have it within your project and that's going to allow us to more easily deploy it later on. So go to your GitHub profile and then on top right, click a plus icon and click new repository. There you can choose a repository name, something like DALI. 
that's available, and you can choose to make it private or public. Finally, click Create Repository. Then I'm going to collapse our browser just a bit. We can close all of our files, go to View and then Terminal, and we can stop both terminals from running. There we go. We can also delete one terminal and clear it. Now make sure to cd dot dot to be in the root of your folder, not in client, not in server, but rather in root. There you can type git init. Then as you can see, we have 9,000 changes, which is never a good sign. So what you want to do is you want to add a new dot git ignore file. And there you can add node underscore modules. Hi there, Adrian from the future here. A really important note. Also make sure to add your .env file right here. If you don't add it, it's going to be pushed to GitHub and you don't want other people to see your secret files. So now you know. This is going to ignore everything that's already mentioned in the package JSON and just gonna left us with 34 files that we ourselves have created. Great. Then we can say git add dot get commit dash m first commit. Then you can copy a couple of messages from here, get branch dash m main, then you want to do get remote at origin. And finally, get push u origin main. And in a couple of seconds, this command is going to push our repository right here to GitHub. With that said, we are ready to deploy the backend of our application, we're going to do that using render. First, we're going to deploy the backend using render, but then we're going to deploy the frontend or the main part of our application using Hostinger, which is going to make it incredibly fast and also give us a custom domain name. Now for render, you can get started or log in. Once you do that, you can click new and choose web service. Next, you can connect your repository. Now it's asking us for a public Git repository. So I'm going to go back to my repo, settings, scroll all the way down, and I'm going to change the repository visibility to public. Once it is public, simply copy the URL, go back and paste it right here and click continue. Then we can enter the name such as DALI. You can choose the region, the branch, and then the root directory. In this case, the root of our directory is going to be that slash server, or I think you can just do server. And then we have to add a command to start our server. In this case, that's going to be npm run server. Finally, you can click create web service. Now the process of deploying our backend can take a couple of minutes. So bear with me, you can pause the video and we'll be right back. Now it looks like our build has failed. And it is possible that that happened because we didn't provide the environment variables. So go back to your .env, which you hopefully added to the .gitignore file, which has to be in the root of our folder right here. Then let's copy the keys one by one. Add environment variable. We can add the open AI API key and we can copy the value. Now we can add more. So that's going to be MongoDB URL. Let's paste that as well. Let's add a bit more. Let's add the Cloudinary cloud name and value. Cloudinary API key and value. And finally, Cloudinary API secret and the value. With that said, we can save the changes. We can go back to events. We can go back to logs and we can rerun our deployment by going to manual deploy and then clear build cache and deploy. Hopefully this time it's going to build successfully. It looks like it failed again. And I just figured out why inside of settings, if you scroll a bit down, you can find the build command or the start command. We typed it as at npm run server. But if you go to our package JSON, it is actually npm run start. So that was a rookie mistake. If we change this to npm run start, save changes and go back to logs. Now we can again rerun the latest commit. This will again take some time, but it just shows you that 
even YouTubers creating educational videos make mistakes like these. It happens to everybody. So just know whenever you make a silly mistake, it happens. You're still a great developer. With that said, let's wait about a minute for this to build and then we'll hopefully see it live. And we hit yet another roadblock. It looks like we're trying to access MongoDB, but it seems that the API we're trying to access it from isn't whitelisted. So we have to whitelist that IP address. Back in our MongoDB Atlas under network access, we can see that our current IP address is whitelisted, but the one belonging to the server isn't. So we can click add IP address and we can allow access from anywhere. At this point, we're not concerned with security breaches. As you can see, it is pending and it is being deployed as we speak. There we go. It took a couple of seconds. And now if we go back to render, hopefully it will rerun it by itself. If that doesn't happen, we'll have to once again run a manual redeploy from the latest commit. It is in progress and hopefully third time's a charm. And there we go. Server started, MongoDB connected, and we are off to the races. Go ahead and click this URL right here, and you can see hello from DALI. That means that our API is deployed. Now we just got to hook it up to our application and then deploy the front end side, which is going to be much, much simpler since we're using Hostinger. So to get started, go back to render and copy this URL. We're going to need it. Now you can close all of the currently open files, go to client, go to source, and now we'll have to change our HTTP localhost 8080 in all instances to our newly redeployed backend URL. So let's search for 8080. You can see we're mentioning it three times on the front end. So let's simply change it in all instances. Right here, we're gonna go up to this point, HTTPS, we're gonna enter this new link, forward slash API, forward slash V1, forward slash DALI. Let's search for other instances. Instead of create post, we're gonna also replace everything up to this forward slash. There we go. And let's repeat the process for the last one. There we go. We successfully updated our front end URLs from the demo local host ones to real deployed URLs. And with that, we are ready to deploy the front end side of our application on our custom domain. And to do that, we can revisit our hosting gears dashboard. I already purchased the domain. As you can see it right here, JSM DALI. That's good. Maybe you have a better one. If you purchased yours, it's going to be right here as well. And if you haven't, you can do that right away. The link is going to be down in the description. If you haven't yet connected the domain to the setup, the setup is going to show right here with a yellow setup button. But if you connected it, as I did in the intro of this video, you can just go to premium web hosting, connect it to that domain and click manage. Once you're here, you can go to the file manager. This is going to open the H panel where we'll be able to drag and drop our files. For now, there's just a public underscore HTML file there. You can go into it and then we can delete the default.php. This is the place where we're gonna put the build of our React application. To get to our build, you can go back to your Visual Studio Code, go to View and then Terminal, CD into Client this time, and simply run npm run build. This is going to create an optimized production build of our application, and we'll simply be able to drag and drop it to our Hostinger's H panel. With Vite, this is super quick and it has been done while I was speaking. There is a dist folder. You can right click it and then click reveal in file explorer or open in finder. Once you have it, you can simply open up the dist folder and drag and drop everything from it right here. It's going to upload the files and our application is going to be live. So now if you go back to your dashboard and click your chosen domain name, our DALI 2.0 is now live. Isn't this crazy? We can see that it is deployed under our special domain and it is HTTPS secured. That is phenomenal. Now, of course, there might be some changes we have to make to properly fetch the data, but that can be fixed easily. 
as you can see, the most important part is that this deployment took less than a minute. And immediately we have premium web hosting, we have a domain name, you can even manage emails on this domain name. Also, it's HTTPS secured. Now let's right click and go to inspect to see what might be the issue with our images. If we reload, we can see type fail to fetch. And now it's fetching posts. I just reload the page one more time and then it fixed itself. I'm guessing that the render backend goes to sleep after being inactive for some time. So once you ping it once, it's going to work perfectly the second time. As you can see, the images we have created are still here, which means our database is up and running on MongoDB. The images are served using Cloudinary, generated by OpenAI. This has been just a phenomenal video and you can just keep creating more great stuff. Let's try it out by using Surprise Me. Let's do something like a surrealist dreamlike oil painting. Let's generate it. And there we go. This is looking phenomenal. Let's go ahead and share it with the community. And if this works, we have properly ensured that all functionalities of our application are working. There we go. But again, I'm really amazed by the fact that we managed to deploy this in a matter of seconds, essentially. So with that said, huge thanks to OpenAI for creating such an amazing software that allows us to build these AI applications. Huge thanks to Hostinger for creating easy to use and fast hosting services. And then huge thanks to you for watching this video. Just keep learning and you're going to become the best there is. With that said, if you'd like to learn on more comprehensive projects, such as a movie app or an NFT marketplace, or you would like to be mentored by myself and other mentors that are going to teach you and help you get a software developer job with one-on-one -on -one mentoring, just go to jsmastery.pro and browse the website a bit. I'm sure you're going to find something you like. Once again, congratulations on coming to the end of this video and have a wonderful day.